Breast augmentation is the number one cosmetic procedure in the United States since 2006. It is estimated that one out of 26 women actually now have implants, and that number is rising. And yet tens of thousands of women are saying and are concerned that their implants are making them sick. And the medical community is brushing them aside, saying it's all in your head, it doesn't exist, and social media is just making this craze, and it's not real. Today, I want to show you some evidence and some literature that actually supports that breast implant illness is real. Now, I didn't get interested in this just because I read about it. I got interested in it because it was actually my own story. This is me over 10 years ago after having bilateral mastectomy, chemotherapy, and implants. Fast forward seven years, I started having a rash on my neck, around my mouth. I didn't feel very good. My thyroid was not being able to regulate but I didn't, we couldn't figure out what was going on. A few months later, we discovered one of my implants had ruptured, and we had it replaced, and instantly the rashes resolved. And I thought, wow, I guess that was connected. But three months later, the other side that wasn't ruptured suddenly started having fluid and having so much problems, we actually thought I had the acute lymphocytic lymphoma, which has also been implicated with breast implants. And I knew without a doubt that I needed to get those implants out. I had a very uh, strenuous surgery, had them both removed. At that time, we found I, I had silicone migration on both sides to the lymph nodes inside my chest. But within days, I felt like 100, 100%, like I'd never felt before, and didn't even realize I'd felt so, so bad. Around the same time, I had this wonderful patient that came in that had ruptured implants removed several years prior and was still convinced that she was having problems because she had had silicone migration into the lymph nodes in her armpits. She was having burning sensations continuously that no medication would help. She was fatigued some days to the point she couldn't even get out of bed. And she had autoimmune conditions on top of that. And so our journey together actually led me to really diving into trying to figure out how do you diagnose, how do you treat somebody who thinks there's a breast implant problem? So first of all, breast implant illness is a vague, vague symptom list, and it doesn't affect every woman the same way. And you can have a few symptoms, you can have a multitude of symptoms. There's not one thing that says, oh, you've got breast implant illness. So I knew I had to think about this a little differently and not just look at just symptoms. So I sat down one day and I thought, okay, with an implant, what could the potential problems be? So I made this list. And I sat down, it's like, okay, could you have an infection that may be lingering even after you remove an implant? What about heavy metals? We know that there's some ingredients in the, in the implants. Could that be a problem? How about silicone migration? Is the migration itself a problem? Does it kick up autoimmune diseases? Do you have sensitivities? Yes, there can be structural problems of the placement of it. What about genetics? Is there a genetic predisposition that can make it harder for you? And the most important thing when you're dealing with this question of is it a breast implant illness or not, is that do you have anything else that could be causing the symptoms not related to the implant? Because you really want to make sure and explore all those possibilities. So armed with my list, I then turned to PubMed. So PubMed is actually the national data bank that uh, all the literature that's reported in the journals. It's very important to realize the number one author that actually uh, submits journal articles are from academic institutions. So that means the majority of people that are um, doing surgeries and seeing this type of things are private sector and they're not turning in their experiences. So if it's listed in PubMed, there's a really good chance that it's a hundredfold, a thousandfold time the cases. So keeping that in mind, I actually went after this. So the first thing I looked at was infection. So are there possibilities of infection that may linger, or infection even at the time of implantation, and years after implantation, that can be a problem? And it turns out there are. There's tons of literature, actually, and this is just a small smattering of all the articles and case reports that are showing a variety of organisms. And the majority of these organisms are not your typical thing. These are all in like the yeast and fungi. They're very unusual things that can be missed and cannot be diagnosed on routine blood work without getting the implants out. I had a conversation with the plastic surgeon not too long ago and asked him, I said, do you routinely culture when you remove an implant? And they said, no, we don't culture unless it looks funny. But if you're having implant illness symptoms, then I would ask you 
to ask the surgeon to go ahead and culture them, even if it doesn't look funny, because you can have a subclinical infection that's creating a lot of problems, and your treatment may be very, very important, heavily relied on that information. But what about heavy metals? So I didn't think too much about heavy metals until I got this result from my wonderful patient. So this is actually a blood uh, test from her, and we see on the mercury, well, that was from amalgams in her mouth, but she had a very high tin level. And I remember going, why does she have high tin? She had no risk factor. She'd never been in a metal plant. She wasn't a factory worker that would, you would think of high risk. So I went on a search. So could tin be associated with breast implants? Turns out it could. This is an example of Allergan safety data sheet. They use tin to cure, as a catalyst to cure the implants. So armed with that information, we started chelating the tin out of her body. And within six weeks when she returned, the burning sensations were already improving, her fatigue was improving, and she was on her way to a better life. So armed with that, I thought, well, what other things could be in these implants? Well, it turns out the implants are made with several layers. So each layer is composed of different materials. And this is an example of a safety data sheet of just one of the implants that are all required to do. And look at the list of the heavy metals on here. And so there's a huge list of them. There's even chemicals that are used that are listed as volatiles to cure and to uh, make the implants. So you can imagine a whole host of potential issues that could be a problem. Now, one of the arguments traditional medicine uses is that these amounts are so small, they can't cause a problem. So I thought, well, okay, let me ask the same question. I already knew that tin had caused a problem in small amounts in my patient. She didn't even have her implants in. She just had silicone migration into her lymph nodes. So I went to the literature and started looking, and it turns out there's actually quite a bit of literature. You're not going to see it associated with the implants because nobody's made that connection yet. But if you look at, can tin be a problem? And the answer is absolutely. They've shown it can happen problems locally, it can have problems distantly, and then also even minor amounts can cause neurological abnormalities as well as a whole host of symptoms. And you can do this for almost every heavy metal out there. The problem is, is that just because one person might have a little bit of tin and another person might have a little bit of tin, they're not going to react the same way. So it's not always the same problem for every single person. So you have to kind of go a little deeper. So what about silicone migration? Because that was brought up in my patient, it was brought up in myself. Can the aspect of silicone migration be a problem? And the answer is yes. And even in 1995, they were discussing that silicone can migrate, and they cause it called a gel bleed. And there's actually studies that show the minute you put the implant in, you can have things leaking out of the, an, an intact capsule into the area around. And then obviously with rupture, it can go into other places. They've even shown way back in 1995 that even when you remove the implant, you can see residual silicone on MRI. So this clearly has been a discussion for decades. Silicone can go into any of the lymph nodes in your chest and your arm. It can go into your liver, your spleen. They've even reported it going into your lung and creating a very unusual lung inflammation. There are studies that actually kind of go through this, and they talk about how it can affect locally and distantly um, information many years after the silicone implant was placed. In addition, they're looking at studies with lymph nodes and silicone migration, and they're starting to think that maybe there is an induced silicone-induced systemic disease. So when I hear systemic disease, I think of autoimmune. Now, one of the arguments traditional medicine says that breast implant illness does not exist is because there's a significant portion of women that when they get their implants out, they don't improve. So let me show you why that's flawed thinking. So if you think of the implant kind of like the match, it's just starting there, it's there to begin with, and next thing you know, because everything's so closely related, it becomes a forest fire. So now the firemen come in and put out that match, or you take out the implant. Did it do anything for the forest fire? No, it didn't. So you're still going to have to treat the forest fire, even though that the implant's been removed. So that's really flawed thinking, and this is why we kind of get stuck with this, and a lot of people go round and round saying autoimmune conditions cannot be linked to the implant, but they can. There's numerous articles and case reports and literature, and actually quite a bit of controversy in PubMed on autoimmune and breast implants, but if you really look at the literature, it's there. 
This is one example of an article that's saying back in even 1998, describing somebody who basically has a multitude of breast implant illness symptoms with low-grade fever, chronic fatigue, muscle pain, um, joint pain, and they felt like it was related to the implants even after the implants were removed. So it's very important. We also know that there's a syndrome called Asia syndrome. So basically, this is autoimmune conditions that are associated with an adjuvant. And the adjuvant is actually the implant. And again, there are numerous reports, numerous articles that are linking implants to this Asia syndrome. But we're not even calling it Asia syndrome. We're not calling it a breast implant illness. We're not calling it anything. We're saying, oh, you're making it up. But it's right here in the literature. And there's a lot of literature that supports this. You can test for autoimmune conditions. And usually with breast implant illness, you might have a positive ANA. You might have some thyroid antibodies. But the rest of this stuff is usually fairly normal. There's nothing that really jumps out and that says, ooh, you've got breast implant illness. So you just have to have this degree of awareness that there could be a possibility. For some reason, we stop and think, OK, as soon as you get diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, you say, oh, we're done. I've got lupus. I have Sjogren's. I have scleroderma. But what caused those conditions? And that's where implant illness becomes important. So what about sensitivity? There's not a lot of literature that supports sensitivity to silicone. And as you saw that laundry list of, of materials that silicone is made of, it would be very difficult to actually pin it down to one thing. But we do know that you can have sensitivities to environmental um, agents. We do know you can have sensitivities to food. It's actually been reported to have sensitivity to dental implants. You can have sensitivity to orthopedic implants. Why is it such a stretch that you can have a sensitivity to any number of the ingredients in a silicone implant? There are actually sensitivity tests that you can do. Even if these come back positive, it doesn't say you have implant illness. It just says you might have a problem with your implants. You really might want to think about that and look a little deeper. So where are we going? Well, right now, we're not really going anywhere. We don't have a national registry that everyone has to report to. You can opt in to report to it. So we're not really getting full reported of the adverse events or even the suggestions of problems. Other countries actually have mandatory models, so hopefully some of their literature will start producing some more information that we can find useful. Israel is even forming a task force that, or they're talking about forming a task force to really investigate some of the breast implant issues, especially since the acute lymphocytic lymphoma has really um, come um, about. But we're not there yet. How about genetics? So we're starting to see that there's some genetic alterations that can predispose you to problems. So maybe someday we'll have a test that you can do before you get an implant to say, you know what, you might want to reconsider that because you're going to be more prone to having an autoimmune condition because of a foreign body or something like that. Now, we're not there yet. There's actually quite a few associations, and I've just listed just a few with potential problems. And I think this is an area that's very exciting, and we're, we're migrating that way, and someday we might get there. But this is still something that's kind of under investigation. So if you think you're having a problem with your breast implants, find out the, figure out the missing pieces. Start asking the questions. Do I have a lingering infection, especially with mold and yeast? Do I have a heavy metal overload, even if you've had the implants removed? Could silicone migration be a problem, even especially if you've had your implants removed? What about that lingering autoimmune condition? Maybe there is a genetic predisposition that can, that can contribute to it. But most importantly, if you think your implants are making you sick, don't give up and keep hope, because I believe that you can heal from breast implant illness. Thank you.